Who are you? It's a question that so many of us have asked ourselves or have been asked at one time or another. For many of us, the question itself is an aggression. For others, it's a lifelong pursuit of self-discovery. Sociologically, we've come up with many ways to immediately and succinctly answer this question. By aligning ourselves with and placing others into certain social groups, we not only are able to answer the question of who we are, but also who we aren't. I'm gay, so I'm not straight. I'm white, so I'm not a person of color. I'm a drag queen, so I'm not a non-drag queen. But language can be messy and limited. Sometimes words can imply that a situation is less complex than it actually is, especially when those words are used to describe others. The words that we use to answer the questions of who we are and aren't are often too simple to describe our actual experiences. This gross misrepresentation can be easily taken advantage of by people in power to keep those who aren't in the margins. On today's episode, we discuss the ways in which racial bias manifests itself through language and social systems to create a self-perpetuating trend that disproportionately benefits white people, specifically in the USA. I'm Kimberly Clark, and this is Listen Up. Listen. 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 Up, up, up. The history of white privilege in America is the story of how certain white people in power, mostly men, manipulated the language of race to benefit those who are white and negatively affect those who aren't. It should go without saying that race is socially constructed, meaning that even though we know that the only factor that physically defines our race is the amount of melanin in our skin, we still ascribe certain beliefs and stereotypes to different races that have no basis in actual physiology. But looks are important. As humans, we naturally gravitate towards others that look like us and have the same experiences. This is sometimes referred to as tribalism. Historically, this natural human tendency has been exploited not only to build stronger communities, but also to demonize, vilify, and dehumanize anyone that operates outside of the tribe. And language has traditionally been an aid to this deception, especially at times in America when life seemed relatively difficult and bleak. By calling the white people that invaded the Americas pilgrims and the millions of indigenous people they murdered savages, white people in power manipulated the language of race to excuse their horrific actions. By referring to white people as masters to the black people who were their property, the institution of slavery was perpetuated in America for hundreds of years, resulting in our swift ascent to world superpower status. And by still using the term founding fathers to refer to the small group of white men that legislatively built our country, but not to the millions of people of color that died while physically building our country's railroads, roadways, cities, and farms, we maintain a society that continues to value the needs, concerns, and lives of its white citizens over those of its non-white ones. Looking at these larger, more ubiquitous examples of how language perpetuates racism points to a systemic issue of how, as a society, we deal with race. The term systemic racism refers to the way that racism, or discrimination based on race, is rooted in and consistently perpetuated by complex socio-political and economic systems and institutions. An individual example of racism is your grandma seeing an African-American person and saying something like, He looks like a pothead. Systemic racism is the fact that in 2013, black and white people smoked marijuana at about the same rate, but black people were 3.7 times more likely to be arrested for it than white people. If your grandma watched the news in 2013 and only saw people of color being arrested for drug offenses, her individual racist tendencies may have been bolstered by the systemic racism that causes police to disproportionately arrest more people of color than white people for drug offenses. In other words, systemic racism is the macro version of racism on the interpersonal level. It's bigger than you, bigger than me, or any other individual and it continues to exist regardless of whether or not we see it for ourselves. 
This is key. Even if you don't experience or witness racism on a personal level, it's still there. And if you live in America, which was a country built on racist practices, you benefit from it. Wait, 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 wait. Stop, 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 wait, wait. Why are we even talking about race? Doesn't talking about race just further divide us? Aren't we supposed to not see color and move towards that post-race society? While on paper this strategy seems noble, it's just not effective. Racism is a disease, and like most diseases, ignoring it doesn't make it go away. If you don't see race, it means that you don't see racism. And if you don't see racism, it means that you don't see the very real struggle that people of color have been dealing with because of their race for generations. This is one of the privileges that we as white people have in America. The privilege to not think about race. The backlash against movements like Black Lives Matter is representative of this privilege. For the first time, many white Americans are feeling like their issues and concerns are being ignored and pushed into the margins. But our new experience is something that people of color have been living for hundreds of years. Black Lives Matter does not imply that white lives don't. It simply implies that while it's obvious that all people should be treated equally, they aren't. They've never been. Not by the police, not by the government, nor by their fellow citizens. This is difficult for a lot of people to understand because, as has been the case many times in America's history, white people in power benefit from denying that the experiences, struggles, and narratives of people of color even exist. This denial is an effective tactic of white supremacy. White supremacy is different from white privilege because it describes an active ideology. As white people in America, we acquire white privilege simply by existing. And I can have privilege while simultaneously thinking that the racist policies and practices that resulted in my privilege are not okay. But white supremacists believe that these privileges are actually rights that only people that look like them deserve. They perpetuate this belief by taking advantage of the lack of real-world experience that many white people have interacting with non-white people, and by fabricating a narrative in which certain white people, specifically members of the working class, are oppressed. It's kind of like the way that the beauty industry heightens or creates personal insecurities in order to sell a product that corrects them. Did you need to buy that poor minimizing primer before you knew your pores were too big, or did you only buy it after you realized that the size of your pores was something that you could and should change? Of course these insecurities lie at an intersection of many social issues like class, race, and gender. They're still taken advantage of by hype-spinning companies trying to make a quick buck. White supremacists, although admittedly much more dubious in intention than most makeup brands, rely on a similar lack of personal experience to create problems and shift blame for their own personal gain. In many ways, we're all becoming more isolated, whether that's geographically, technologically, or emotionally, despite the fact that we live in a world with instant access to billions of human stories. This isolation can make us unwilling to understand other people's experiences, and it even might make us more susceptible to being convinced by more powerful people like us that these other people are really to blame for all of our problems. These bigger, better, like us people are awesome. I mean, they look like us, they have the same experiences as us, we're all in the same tribe. If they say that those other people are to blame for our woes, they're probably right. This is what white supremacists want, to shift blame away from those actually responsible for our failing economy, lack of jobs, and wavering national security. It's just another example of how white people in power manipulate the language of race for personal gain. By keeping our experiences isolated and not allowing us to share, grow, and learn from each other, we're limited in our capacity to see the bigger picture. 
In other words, if we're too busy worrying about hating each other, we're less likely to notice the ways that corporate greed, government corruption, and unbridled capitalism benefit a minuscule percentage of the population, while the rest of us fight for scraps. This is our greatest tool for combating white supremacy, uncovering the ulterior motives of those perpetuating it. It's the realization that these bigoted megalomaniacs aren't interested in anyone's personal gain but their own, and will take advantage of our fear and lack of personal experience any chance they get. We need to break this cycle by calling out white supremacists and acknowledging that systemic racism and white privilege exist. But if we do, doesn't it mean that I, as a white person, don't deserve my success? If we accept that the playing field has never been level, then doesn't it invalidate all the work that I've actually done to get where I am? Doesn't it mean that I'm only successful because I'm white? Oh yeah, that's a that's kind of an interesting point. I mean, that could possibly- No! Every white person benefits from white privilege, but that doesn't mean that we don't all face our own hardship or struggle. However, the fact that I am white does imply that certain situations I've been in or experiences I've had were made easier because of my race. It's not that I haven't worked hard for what I've achieved, but I've never once felt or been made to feel that my achievements have been gained in spite of my being white. Yes, there are other factors that may have made it more difficult for me to succeed in different situations like my being queer, for example. But my race just hasn't been one of those factors. To many, admitting this is the same as admitting culpability or guilt. But I don't think it is. I think you only have to feel guilty if you admit that white privilege exists, but are unwilling to do anything about it. Instead, if we take advantage of our privilege and use it to try to combat the systems that unfairly created it, we don't have anything to feel guilty about. If you want more info on this topic, please check out Kat Black's video on white guilt. For me, personally accepting my white privilege, and more importantly, identifying the systems that created it, has only allowed me to have new experiences and engage in new conversations. I'm proof that it's possible to be a white person who moves through the world while simultaneously acknowledging the corrupt systems that either directly or indirectly make my journey easier. Acknowledging how racism affects other people has allowed me to accept other people and to learn and grow from their stories and experiences. But of course, the hardest part about learning something is admitting that you don't already know it. Admitting one's ignorance is as difficult as admitting one's white privilege, but it's the only way that we can get to that diverse utopia of the future. For me, that means there's just more things for me to learn, more experiences for me to explore. I'm constantly seeking out and listening to new stories from new people. Not only does sharing our personal experiences with others help us put our own lives into a more global and therefore more detailed perspective, it also exposes us to personal growth. It's like trimming away the weeds of ignorance so you can grow and blossom into something not only beautiful, but thoughtful, aware, and awake. In most videos in my Listen Up series, this is the part of the video where I link to other videos or YouTubers or sources for you to learn more about the topics that I've discussed. But I'm going to put all of those links and sources that I've mentioned and some more really helpful resources for you down in the description box. And I'm going to reserve this time to give you some very clear action steps that can help you directly combat systemic racism. Number one, know your history. There was a draft of this video where I tried to write a complete racial history of the United States. I ended up editing that down quite heavily, but I had to include something about the origins of racism in our country because history is so important. It's context. It's the human context. And understanding the mistakes of the past is the only way that we can make sure we don't repeat them in the future. But, of course, histories can be rewritten for personal gain. 
with the pervasiveness of pundits and partisan news outlets and fake news and it's all of this this media saturation it it, it can be a little difficult to make sure you're really getting the facts facts are pretty important to history but that's why you just have to go further check the links check the sources go the extra step if you don't trust journalists be your own fact checker find it out for yourself you're on the internet right now use it number two expand your experience and expanding your experience could mean anything it could mean trying to engage in new social activities with new people that maybe are different from you. It could be reading or researching or watching documentaries about people that aren't like you. Just trying to absorb other human experiences. There's so many. Why not absorb as many as you can, right? A really amazing way is to use this platform that we're on right now, YouTube. The whole premise of this is people sharing their individual experiences. So it's a great way for you to easily have a direct line to the experiences of people that might not look like you or have the same life experiences as you. A way to check to see if you're doing this is to just look at your subscription feed. Do you see people that look exactly like you or the same gender, age, race, sexuality, or have the same interests as you? Are you only getting a mirrored image of your own experience, or are you allowing this platform to really help you expand your experience? And especially if you don't know about something, YouTube is a perfect place, as we all know, to learn more about it. That goes for people's experiences too. Why not go to the source? If your opinions about people that are not like you are based on things that people that are like you have told you, gotta do some research. And luckily, we're here, we're on YouTube, it's about you, it's about me, it's about sharing stories. You're halfway there. Go, explore, mix it up, see what happens. Number three, identify yourself. If you support movements for social change, let everyone know. It may seem minimal, but wearing a button like this one is really helpful. It lets the world know your stance on racial equality and how you're not afraid to stand for it or to engage in a discussion about it. I got this pin from a seller on Etsy that donates part of the proceeds to the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, of course, you can't just wear the pin. You gotta stand behind the beliefs, right? But identifying yourself really shows our strength in numbers. It lets everyone else know that we're here, we're not going anywhere, and we believe in this stuff. Wearing your ideals on your sleeve, or your lapel, if you will, not only helps identify yourself as an ally to like-minded people, but it also helps you engage with people that might have a difference of opinion. Which brings us to action step number four. Engage. Call them in. Instead of calling them out or trying to shut down a conversation, try to call someone in into a new conversation if you hear something racially offensive or inappropriate. Especially if you're a white person in a group of exclusively white people. Basically, if you hear someone say something racist or offensive or inappropriate, say something. Ask them why they said what they said. Try to explain to them how it might be considered offensive or the systemic problems of racism in our country. Hey, send them this video if you want. But make sure as you're engaging, you're encouraging conversation instead of trying to shut one down. If you have to get hypothetical, try to keep it on the personal level and not talk about giant facts, figures, and statistics. Try to talk about people's personal experiences, and if someone is disrespecting a specific group of people, try to investigate why they feel that way about those people. Something in their life has caused this. You've heard it before, but racism is taught. It's, you're not born with it. It came from somewhere. And the more people are able to understand where their own racism comes from, the easier it'll be for them to be able to overcome it. I know it might be tough, but this is a really important step. You can do it. And finally, number five, resist. Sometimes the personal work of educating yourself, learning your history, and expanding your own experience just isn't enough. And sometimes engaging with people just isn't convenient. When none of these other tactics are enough, you've got to resist. It's extremely important to actively resist oppressive, racist, or inappropriate policies whenever you see them. 
if you see our government or any institution that you participate in perpetuating unjust, racist, unlawful policies or practices, you have to stand up to them. This might mean actively becoming involved in lawmaking, showing up to town hall meetings, calling your representatives and congresspeople. It might mean going through human resources at your job and identifying racism or making sure that people are reprimanded for continuing to perpetuate an unsafe environment. You have to let those in power know that you will not sit idly by while racist policies continue. If you have the resources, means, and or courage, you have to stand up for the most marginalized in our communities. Their voices are being silenced left and right. And if you have a voice and you got a place to share it, you got to use it. Got to stand up. You got to resist. And hell, I'm going to be there too. I'll be here with you. Join me on the front lines, kiddo. Let's do this. Tamika Mallory, who was one of the co-organizers of the Women's March on Washington, ended her amazing speech that day with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King said, I will not remember the harsh words of my enemies. I will remember the silence of my friends. God bless you. Whatever your race, religion, gender identity, or expression, the fact that you are watching this video right now means that you have the privilege, the power, to connect to a world that is greater than you. Please, please, please share this video with anyone that you think might benefit from seeing it, and make sure to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss future videos in my Listen Up series. If you really want to support the making of these videos, consider making a per video donation to me via Patreon. Uh, all the info you need is down below. Thank you so much to all of my Patreon supporters. These videos truly would not be able to happen without your support. Coming up in this series, I've got my thoughts on drag. That was kind of supposed to be this video, my third video in the series, but I thought that this topic was a little more pressing and important. If you missed my first two videos in this series, please check them out. They deal with gender and consumerism, respectively, and believe it or not, there are a ton of intersections between both of those topics and this topic. And I think those videos also give you a little bit more personal context of what motivates me to try to promote social change. Let me know in the comments down below how you've personally dealt with issues of privilege or systemic racism or ways that you figured out to combat it within your own communities, or even ways to just further discuss or unpack these really intense and sometimes incendiary topics. We've all had to deal with privilege in some way or another, so tell me how you've dealt with it, whether that's your own or that of others that you observe and how it affects you and your life. As you know, I'm interested in a dialogue that is based on sharing personal experiences. So please engage in that type of discussion here. However, if you start to try to tell other people what their experiences are or how they should live their lives, I will delete your comment and block you from commenting on this channel. There's simply not enough time to share everyone's experiences and your ideas of what those experiences should or shouldn't be. Let's keep it personal, keep it respectful, and keep it on point. But I look forward to some really fascinating discussions with you down below. Well, this has been another episode of Listen Up. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Kimberly Clark. Bye!